was a kid, I had no idea what love was, and I'm still not really sure that I do, but when I was a kid, you know, love got me what I wanted. You know, I would date a girl at 14, 15, 18, I'd say, I love you, and I got what I wanted. And with my mom, I would say, Mom, I love you, and I would get a hockey mask or a hockey puck or something. Love worked out great as a kid, but that's not, that's not what love is. And, and when you look at love and you say, what's love got to do with it? In the eyes of God, it has everything to do with it. It's all about love. So today I want to look at love and, and, and describe and figure out what it is and what it's not and how it applies to us and to Him. When you're looking at love, you have to first figure out, you know, why is there love in the first place? You know, you look at God and you say, God, why did you make us? You know, we're filthy and dirty and disgusting and there's, and there's sickness and there's rape and there's murder and there's all these horrible things in, in the earth. Why did you do this to yourself? Why did you create such a headache? Well, if you knew it was going to happen, why'd you do this? If, if you knew what you were in for, why would you do something like this? That just makes no sense. So you've got to first describe and figure out why did he do this? And it's really kind of simple in terms of why. You know, the angels don't choose to love him. They don't. It's their job to worship him. It's their job to service Him. They were created to worship and to service. It's not a choice. It's an obligation. They carry out God's will. They, they do what He needs them to do, right? So they don't really choose to love Him. Their love is a little more robotic, a little more automated. It's intellectual. Their love is more obli obligatory, I love you. So He made us for fellowship. He made us to share His love. He made us so we can experience His love because for us, it's a choice. You know, do you want your spouse to love you because you make them or because they choose to? Do you want your kids to love you because you make them or because they choose to? So we were created for fellowship. It's a choice. For us, love is a choice. It's a choice to fellowship. It's a choice to worship. It's a choice to service. You can choose to be in His presence or choose not to be in His presence. For us, love is a choice. So He was willing to go through all the hassle of the universe and all the bad stuff just for love because He loves us that much and wants to be with us that much. He'll put up with all the other nonsense to be with those that want to be with Him. Next slide, Leo. All right, excellent. Um, and how do you know when you're in love? So I went uh, online and I found some simple ways you can tell when you're in love. As we go through these, think about your spouse, your kids, your parents. So think about God and think about how you know when you're in love. When you always want to be together. When you're not together, you're thinking about them. When you feel incomplete without them. When you trust someone with your unconditional, intense affection. When you would do anything for someone. When you're putting your needs ahead of someone else. When you hide nothing of yourself because they accept you. When they are the last thing you think about before you go to sleep and then when you wake up in the morning. When a smile's on your face thinking about that person. When you want to show your affection, devotion to each other. When thoughts of that person warms your heart and brings serenity. When they hurt, you hurt. When they are joyful, you are joyful. Now, of course, Facebook has its own definition. I found this, someone posted it, and I said, that's pretty cool, that's perfect. And this was a post that I saw on someone's page somewhere. It says, find someone that isn't afraid to admit they miss you. Someone that knows you're not perfect, but treats you as if you are. Someone who couldn't imagine losing you. Someone who gives their heart to you completely. Someone who says, I love you, and proves it. Last but not least, find someone who wouldn't mind waking up next to you in the morning, seeing your wrinkles and gray hair, but still falls in love with you all over again. That's a Facebook definition. But the part that, for me, is the big deal, where it says, someone who says, I love you, and proves it. See, love will always prove itself. Whether it's taking the kids to a soccer game, or uh, giving your spouse a hug before they go to work, or making dinner. Love will always prove itself. When someone's hurting and, and you hug them and you talk to them, you comfort them, love will always prove itself. And Christ on that cross proved His love by outstretching His arms and dying for us. His love 
proved itself. Proved itself. He went to the cross knowing, knowing what he was doing. And we'll get to that in a second. But proving itself, which is why he asks us to have faith. Now think about this for a second. Love is an action. Love is a, is a choice. Okay? The Bible says it is impossible to please him without faith. Faith's an action. Love is an action. What he's really saying to you is your faith is an expression of your love for him. When you stay in faith and you hold in faith, what you're really doing is saying, God, I believe you're there. I believe you're real. I'm going to prove my love for you and stand here strong, believing you're able to do what you said you're going to do. That's faith. That's proving your love. Love will always prove itself. And with faith, that's how we do that. That's why he requires. He doesn't ask for it. He requires faith. And of course, God has his own definition of love. And he says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. That's a God's definition. And love never fails. Let me explain to you why love will never fail. Because his love is perfect. Because he is perfect. That means, yes, bad things will happen to you. Otherwise, how do you have faith, right? Bad things will happen, but love in the end will always win. It might be ugly, it might not be pretty, but in the end God gets glorified, your faith grows, you become more like Him, and God will get the glory for the victory in the issue you're having faith over. Love will never fail. Trust in Him. Have faith. Show Him you have your faith. God will win, because he said so. Now, of course, there's always an Allen definition of something. So I this is my definition of love. Uh, L is let's go of pain. O is omits to deny self. V is vanquishes all fear. And E, which will make no sense right now, is Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Sabachthani. Real love. Let's go of pain, okay? Well, the Bible says that when we bring our sin to him and confess our sin. He cast that sin as far east as to the west. He forgets that sin immediately. He forgets our sin once we say, hey, I'm sorry, right? He also, on that cross, when he was dying on the cross, he said, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. So he says he forgets our sins. He forgives us. Now check this part out. He says, if you don't forgive others, he can't forgive us. He says also, the measure you use against somebody else is the measure he'll use for you, right? He says also, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Okay, if they're your enemies and they're persecuting you, they're probably not very nice to you, right? They're probably doing some mean things to you. He says, forgive them. Here's the key why he wants you to forgive them. Because your anger, your resentment, your bitterness keeps you hostage to whatever it is you're going through. And the person you're mad at probably isn't even thinking about it. So you're sitting here focused on something they're not even thinking about, and you're letting that person win over and over and over again, and there's no way you can strive towards the kingdom and strive towards what he's asked you to do when you're stuck in resentment and bitterness. There's no way. It keeps you hostage. It keeps you prisoner. It's Satan's way of making sure that you are never what God made you to be. See, he asks us to forgive. Uh, many years ago, uh, a friend of mine, um, basically, without going through the whole entire story, stole $75,000 from me. It's a lot of money. Um, and I was a little mad. And um, a lot mad. And I had a really hard time letting go of it, and it consumed every part of me. It consumed everything I thought of. It consumed everything I did. It was on my mind every single second of the day. It became impossible to do anything for him because I kept thinking about that money and what the person did. It kept me hostage. And that person wasn't even thinking about it. I can guarantee you that. So then I heard a sermon where Pastor Bob here many years ago said that Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed by a friend. 
And I went, well, that makes sense. I mean, when you're being, when your friends ditch you on a cross and all 12 of your, well, 11 of them leave, okay, and leave you dying, I could see why you'd be upset, right? And on the cross, he says, forgive them, right? He's sitting there dying and says, forgive them. His best friends turned on him. He let go of it. And he requires me to let go of my issues so I could be useful to him. Uh, William Gladstone was a prime minister uh, of Britain in the 1800s. And uh, he gave a speech uh, at the House of Commons. And again, I'm sorry, O is omit and deny self. Um, he gave a speech about his wife, Princess Alice. Uh, Princess Alice, uh, she had just passed away, and he was announcing it to everyone in the, in the House of Commons. And he told the story of how uh, their daughter was dying of diphtheria, okay? And the family was told, do not breathe near her. Do, do not go near her and breathe, or you'll catch it and you'll die. Well, the daughter was grasping for air and couldn't breathe and was, it was struggling to breathe, and the mom was so distraught. And, and the kid said, Mommy, kiss me. Well, Princess Alice, because she's a loving mother, despite the fear, despite the warning, kissed her child. And she died a few days later. Okay? That's real love. Love, real love omits and denies and removes self from the equation. Completely strips self away. Real love doesn't know fear. Real love doesn't know danger. Real love won't count the cost. Real love does whatever is required to get the job done. And that's why Christ stayed on the cross. Because think about it. He could have called angels. He could have gotten down from there in a heartbeat. He could have just, I ain't doing this. At any point in that time where he had pain, a lot of pain, spear in his side, no less, okay? He could have gotten down at any point in time, but he stayed on the cross because of love, completely omitting and denying self. But vanquishes is a pretty good one, which means it gets rid of, it removes, it takes away, it conquers. Love, real love conquers all fear. In the song, these are the actual lyrics from the song. It says, I've been thinking of a new direction, but I, I have to say I've been thinking about my own protection. It scares me to feel this way. How many times does the Lord knock on your heart and give you a new direction or a new way or a new path? He says, I want you to go this way, okay? And you're so scared you don't do it, and you're so scared, you're afraid, that you, you just cannot do this. Well, Jesus, okay, in the gardens praying, God, if you got another way, wouldn't mind something else, please? If, if you want me to do this, I'll go to the cross, I'll do it. But if you got something else, I'll take it. And he, he sweats drops of blood and fear, okay? But Jesus knew that his destiny was on the other side of that fear. Think about that. Jesus knew the destiny that the Father had for him was on the other side of that fear. So he went to the cross, right? For me, uh, God is putting me in a new, new direction. It's scary. I'm not thrilled over it. It's scary. But I know that behind that fear on the other side is my destiny. So I will go through it and face that fear knowing that God loves me enough to take care of it along the way. Benaiah in First Chronicles, there's a story of, a, of, it's a very small story. You probably miss it when you read the Bible, but... But, but Benaiah was out in the mountains one day and saw it was all snowy. It was, the hill was covered in snow, and he sees a lion trapped in a pit. Snow, lion, in a pit. I'm thinking I just walk away, right? Not Benaiah. Benaiah decides, you know what? He has a feeling that God has put it on him, that God's love and God's presence is with him. He decides to jump into the pit and kill the lion. There's only one reason why anybody would jump into a pit and kill a lion is if you just knew inside of you with all your might that your destiny is on the other side of that fear. That's what I'm thinking, right? Well, Benaiah kills a lion and it ends up King David's looking for a bodyguard, going through resumes and stuff, you know. He's looking, through, looking for the best person online, looking at all the things and, you know, monster.com. And he finds Benaiah, Benaiah who has a history of killing lions and Benaiah becomes 
King David's chief bodyguard over the 30, there's 30 of them. He's in charge of all 30 bodyguards. He also becomes the commander of King David's army. Benaiah also, this is really pretty cool, he became the guy playing the harp when the ark was moved through Jerusalem. He got to make the joyful noise as the ark passed by. Why? Because he killed the lion. And he also got to save King Solomon's army as his commander with a, a revolt. So Benaiah knew his destiny was on the other side of his fear, and all those amazing things happened because he, he was okay with facing that challenge. Fear. Fear will always take away what God has for you always. Now think back to what I said. God requires faith to please him. Faith is the way you show you love him. Faith is the way you show him that you believe he's there, he's real, and answers your prayer. Okay, now hang on. Now, fear. I need, well, let me do it like this. Who thinks, by a show of hands, that I could shoot this gun and hit one, a balloon? Who thinks somebody, see if you all know me, okay, that's pretty good. So you believe, you believe that I could shoot this gun and hit a balloon. There's a lot of them there, right? Odds are in my favorite, right? Okay, I need a volunteer to put a balloon in their mouth while I shoot it. Any volunteers? <laughs> okay, there, okay, there's, there's uh, of course the, kid, the kids are willing, okay, because they're not old enough to know that it's not a good idea. It's like playing in that side, right, with your friends. Okay, hang, hang on, so only the kids had their hands up. So what that says is, is a difference in believing and having faith. Even the demons believe God is real. Even the demons believe God is God. But you had the faith, the faith to believe God is God. Okay? Now, where, where's Greg Carver? Greg's waving. Uh, Greg was a policeman for 12 years. If I get it wrong, please tell me. Uh, Greg belongs to the NRA. Uh, he is a military tactics expert. Uh, he's also a firearms instructor. He's pretty good with a gun. Okay? Who would be willing at this point to let... Greg, shoot a balloon out of your mouth. Anybody? A lot more hands up. <laughs> Why is that? Because Greg has some credibility. God has credibility. God said he would die, uh, be buried, and resurrected. He said that. He said it was going to happen in advance many years before. He said that was going to happen. To pull that feet off, you got to be God. So God's got credibility. God spoke. The universe was created. God spoke and there was light. God spoke and Lazarus raised from the dead. God spoke and the centurion's child was healed. All God's got to do is speak. That's it. Just speak. God has credibility in the words he uses and says. He has credibility. And he says all things are possible to those who believe. Right? So if you believe, if you believe, you're okay. Hold the balloon in your mouth. If your family isn't saved, if your finances are messed up, you can't find a job, hold the balloon in your mouth because you believe he is real. All things are possible to those who believe. He says also, all things work for the good of those who love him. Do you love him? If you love him, hold the balloon in your mouth in faith. Hold it in your mouth knowing that you love him and he loves you back perfectly. Perfectly. It might not be easy. It might not be pretty. But he loves you perfectly. Hold that balloon in your mouth. He says, seek the kingdom first and all of these things will be added to you. Are you seeking the kingdom first? If you are, then it's okay. You're all right. Hold the balloon in your mouth and know it's going to be okay. Hold it in your mouth knowing he loves you perfectly. He will not hurt you. It might be scary. It might be frightening. Maybe you don't like it a whole lot. Maybe you're really upset. Okay, but, you, but know that he is God and he has credibility in what he says. Did you know that God says in Numbers 23, 19 that he's not a liar? He's not a liar. So think about it like this. If he can't lie, if he's holy and he's perfect, 
You're challenging his integrity by saying he can't come through or won't come through. You're challenging his very nature. You're challenging his integrity by saying you can't, you won't, you're not going to. You're a liar. He's not a liar. Stand there in faith. Hold that balloon in your mouth knowing he will provide. He will come through. His grace is sufficient and believe that. And his love is perfect. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. What he's really saying is, if you're fearful when you're in God's will and you're fear fearful and you know you're within his hands and you're right where you ought to be and you're scared, you're not truly understanding love. That's what that's saying. You're not truly understanding what love is if you're fearful while you're in God's will. Because fear is about punishment. Fear is about pain. Fear is about bad things. Fear is the opposite of love. There is no fear in love. Believe he's able to do what he says he's going to do because he loves you that much to do it. He already won the victory at Calvary. He already died for you and took care of it in advance. Real love. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Those are the words in Latin that Christ spoke on the cross saying, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And I met somebody a few months back who said that I can't believe in this whole father-son thing because I can't understand how, how a father would leave a kid who's dying. I can't understand how, you know, how God just left Christ on the cross and left him to die. That doesn't make any sense how a father-son would operate, and it's certainly not how a father-son-God team how it would work, right? Well, when he said that, he didn't understand what love really is. The father gave up his son to save everybody else, okay? And you have to understand what was happening at the cross. What was really happening is, is that every sin known to mankind was on Jesus, okay? Think about this. Every rape, every murder, every uh, adulterous act, you know, you name it. Whatever sin you could think of was on him. Sin can't be in the Father's presence. It can't. It can't. And on that cross was the offering for sin, and it can't be in his presence, so God had to look away for a moment, because it couldn't be within his presence, or otherwise it would nullify the whole point of the cross in the first place. Okay? And how many times do we sin, and sin repeatedly, and sin over and over again, and insult, Hebrews 10.26 says, paraphr paraphrased, we insult the cross, we insult what he did, when we sin repeatedly, we, we spit in his face and say what he did wasn't sufficient and not good enough. We tell him, we actually say, we, we actually make the blood useless for us when we sin over and over again, okay? But when we sin or reject love or abuse love or deny love, love has a way of backing up a little bit. When you reject it, it will back up. It won't ever leave you or forsake you, but it will back up a little bit, okay? And to be in a father's presence, we have to let him take care of our sin and stop sinning when we know it's a sin. You know, when, when I come up here and pray first, we go back there and pray, my prayer is always, we all have different prayers, but, but, but mine is, God forgive me in my sin. It's my prayer before I walk up here. Because I want to come to him clean. You know, the Levites, before they would walk into the Holy of Holies, would pray up and clean up to come before him. So I, I try and come here clean, because I, I sin a lot. I don't know about you, but I'm real, real good at sinning, okay? So I, I, try, I try and come here clean, so he can be, I can be in his presence. So sin has a way of taking love and backing it up a little bit, because cause sin can't be in his presence. I hear over and over again, I can't believe in your God. I can't, I can't believe in Jesus. I, I can't believe in a God who would send his kids to hell. I can't believe that. There's no way. I can't believe how a God who will love me enough to then send me to hell. Well, my, my answer is pretty simple. God isn't sending anybody anywhere. It's your choice. Go back to the why thing back before. Why did he make us? He made us to love him and to share his love. If against your will, 
He takes you to heaven. So you spend your entire life rejecting Him and denying Him and denying His love. You spend your entire life saying, eh, and He takes you to heaven against your will. That makes Him a cosmic kidnapper of sorts. Because why would He want you in His eternity forever when you don't want Him at all? That, that, that makes no sense. It also would make the cross pointless. Why would He go and die on a cross? He had to save us from something. So if you sit here and say hell doesn't exist, then what you're really saying is the cross didn't mean anything. You're denying the cross and the power of the cross and what the cross really meant by you saying hell doesn't exist. This book, this book mentions uh, Satan or the devil by name 100 times. It mentions hell by name, or Sheol, which is in Hebrew is hell, 60 times. God mentions hell and the devil more than anything except money. Go figure. Okay? So when you sit here and say, well, I believe in God. God's real. I believe in God. Okay? Well, if you believe in God, you believe in Satan too because God believes in Satan. Satan is real. Satan is alive. Satan wants you to believe it doesn't exist. When things go bad in your life, he wants you to blame God. Not God. Now, God will let it happen to you to, to push you to him and to, and to have something to have faith over. Okay? Otherwise, you can't express your love. But bad things don't come from God. Only good things come from God. I can believe hell doesn't exist all day long. I can believe I'm six foot two. I am six foot two. Well, I might believe with all my heart I'm still wrong. Okay? So hell does exist, and hell is a real, a real thing because, like I said before, sin can't come in his presence. It can't. If sin were in his presence, it would corrupt heaven the same way it corrupts earth. So sin can't be in his presence. Who do we to judge our creator how he handles sin? It's up to him how he handles it. And his method is a place to send sin. sin is, hell is not for bad people. There are many, 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 many good people in hell. But they're people that chose their sin over him. The people that chose their own flesh over him. The people that chose their own way over him. People that denied his reality and the cross and the blood because they wanted their own way. There are good people in hell. For me to sit here and say hell is real, it affects my wife and I more than a lot of people. Our entire family has, has re rejected the cross. So I'm telling you this in that situation. Hell is real. It's a real place. And there are many people that are going to spend eternity there away from him. Did you know why hell is hell? Because God's not there. God, God is peace. God is joy. God is warmth. God is love. God is a lot of beautiful things. He's not in hell. So those things aren't there. That's why it's hell. With every head bowed and every eye closed, and no one's looking, no one's watching, and I, you know, um, I'd feel horrible going on and not at least giving the opportunity for someone somewhere. Um, if, if you've never truly given your heart to the Lord, if you've never truly said to Him, yeah, yeah, God, you know what? I believe in you. I believe in the cross. I believe in what you did. Yeah, make me whole. Take my sin. Make me whole. I, I believe in you. I, I want to be yours for eternity. I choose you. I'm making the choice to make you my God and Savior. If you've never done it before, just please raise your hand. And no, it's just me looking at no one else. If, if you've never done that, please raise your hand. I just, I just want to pray with you right now. If anybody out there has, thank you, I see your hand, thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else who just wants to just pray for a second? It's a choice. Going to heaven and an eternity is your choice. And is anybody else, I see one hand. Anybody else that just wants to make God their king and savior? Thank you, I see a second hand. Anybody else? Eternity is a very long time, folks. Long. Without God, without His presence, without His love, without His peace and joy, hell is the absence of God. And it's real. Anybody else want to put God first and make Him yours? Anybody else?
Okay, I just want to pray. If, if you had your hand up, just pray quietly with me as, as we pray. And no one, no, one, no, no one knows your hands up, just, just me and you. And just repeat to yourself as I pray. Father, thank you. I believe in your blood. I believe in the cross. I believe you died to save me. Come into my heart. Make me, me more like you. Guide my steps. Make me yours for eternity. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, okay, well the trick is to keep walking. The trick is to keep walking straight. Um, the next thing I want to do, I, I believe the Lord gave me, and um, love is a choice. Love is an action. Faith is a choice. Faith is an action. And what we're going to do is something different today. We're going to do a thing called, I don't know if I made it up or not, but I'm calling it a prayer call. What I want to do is to show the Lord we love Him with an action of love and an act of faith, an act of obedience. And what we're going to do is, I'm going to have the band come up right now. If, if you're in the band, come on up. What we're going to do is the band's going to play as long as one person is praying. And what we're going to do is, in a moment, not right now, I'm going to have you go to different spots in the sanctuary. Find a spot that you feel fits you, that you'd feel comfortable praying in. What I want you to do is to go there in a moment and, and go pray. And you could pray for a, a, a neighbor, for a person in your family. You could pray for yourself. I don't care what you're praying about. It's between you and him. Whatever you feel is on your heart, I want you to pray. But I want you to pray as an act of love, as an act of worship, as an act of, of obedience, and in faith. See, when you pray in faith, you believe He hears you. You believe He's there. You believe He's listening. You believe He's going to follow through on what you're praying for in the first place. That's an act of faith. It's showing your love. And what I want you to do too is if you're a prayer warrior and you feel led to go somewhere, please just go and pray quietly. And as you feel like you're finished, you're dismissed. Are you willing to stand in the gap for your family, for this country, for our neighbor, for yourself, for this church's finances? Will you stand in the gap for somebody else as an act of love? So please don't forget, as you exit, we can hear you out there. If you're a prayer warrior and you feel, you feel led somewhere, please go pray. And God bless you.